Good morning, everyone. We're so happy to have you here for our occasional roughly monthly resilience presentation series hosted by the ETSU Ballot Health Strong Brain Institute. Uh, if you would like to be added to our email list where we announce our resilience um, speakers, please type your email address in the chat and we will be, de be delighted to add you to our listservs. My name is Wallace Dixon and I am director of the Strong Brain Institute. The Strong Brain Institute was founded by a $1 million four year gift to ETSU from Ballot Health. And I am truly honored to be asked to help lead and build the organization. The majority of Americans have experienced at least one major adverse experience at some point in their childhood. At ETSU specifically, one in four of our students have lived through or may still be living through three or more major adverse experiences. The goal of the Strong Brain Institute is to use the science of childhood adversity, coupled with mitigation science and resilience science to prevent and mitigate the negative effects, negative impacts of ACEs on children's and adults' mm -hmm. lives and to pr promote awareness in the use of resilience and form procedures and policies, both at ETSU and throughout the Appalachian Highlands region. We are a resource for people to turn to when they have questions about how best to employ resilience-informed strategies and practices in their workspaces. Today, I'm happy to introduce our speaker, Melissa Roberts. With over 20 years of nonprofit experience in a wide variety of roles, Community, community service is in Melissa Roberts' DNA. She is a member of the Bristol Noon Rotary Club, the Regional Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Alliance, Virginia Organizing, the National Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practices, and the State of Tennessee Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System stakeholders, to name just a few. Presently, Melissa serves as the Executive Director for Appalachian Promise Alliance, and we are happy to have her with us today. On a personal note, I first got to meet Melissa probably about three years ago um, when I first started working on the Strong Brain Institute and found her an amazing person to tolerate, I suppose is the best word, acceptance of an academic who has no history um, engaging in regional and community activities. And so she's, I'd like to, to recognize her for, for accepting me into her world and uh, allowing uh, herself to be part of mine as, as it, if you know anything about academia, we're, we're not usually going out into the community and making, uh, developing a, relationships with community partners. But as part of the Strong Brain Institute, I certainly got that opportunity and Melissa is probably the number one person with whom I've uh, had a, a strong connection. And even to this day, we're working on several projects, including the Trauma-Informed Workplace, which is an initiative of the Office of Injury Prevention uh, in the Tennessee Department of Health. And so I really enjoy working with her. She's such a nice um, and accommodating individual, and I'm happy to hear what she has today. So thanks for being with, here, with us here, Melissa, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Wally. I appreciate it. Um, so hello, everybody. It's good to see you all on this Monday morning. I do want to take just a minute to thank Wally and Lisa and Michelle and Ben and the whole Strong Brain Institute team. Um, you know, we have been working together for a while, and um, I appreciate all of the support that that they give and um, and for them inviting me here today to talk with you all. So let me see. Can you all see my screen? There it goes. Yes? Okay. All right. Fantastic. So as Wally said, my name is Melissa Roberts and I'm the Executive Director for Appalachian Promise Alliance. And today I want to talk to you about a couple of different things. I want to tell you a little bit about who Appalachian Promise Alliance is. Um, but then I also want to talk to you about collective impact in theory and in practice with our Northeast Tennessee Trauma Responsive Care Network. Um, feel free to put questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Michelle, thank you so much for monitoring those for me. It's hard to both present and, and answer those. So a little bit about Appalachian Promise Alliance. Bristol's Promise was founded in 1999 and came out of a community envisioning process. And at that time, there really were no identifiable coalition work 
groups around children, youth, and families. And that's where our Youth Networking Alliance um, came in. And so we incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit organization in 2006, and we're one of those few organizations that was able to work across the state line in both Tennessee and Virginia. So you can see our original service area um, in the map here, the little red dot that you see. Uh, that was Bristol, Virginia and Bristol, Tennessee that allowed us to support partner organizations who were state bound, right? There are some partners who come to the, the Virginia line and they have to stop their work and some who come to the Tennessee line and have to stop their work. And so we were able to cross that. As our service area changed, we realized that our name also needed to change because so many people's first reaction when they heard our name was, oh, I, I thought you only served Bristol. So you can see in this next map how our service area has changed just a little bit. Um, our current direct service area includes the upper eight counties of Northeast Tennessee and five counties and two independent cities in Virginia. But we're also providing consulting and collaboration services in 54 out of 55 counties in West Virginia. Um, as Wally said earlier, we're partnering with the Strong Brain Institute on a statewide trauma-informed workplace initiative for the entire state of Tennessee. And we're in conversation with several Virginia organizations to provide consulting and piloting services in key areas of the Commonwealth of Virginia. So, in December of 2022, we received approval from the state to change our name to Appalachian Promise Alliance. We're still in that rebranding process, so you all are really kind of the first ones to hear the, the history and the backstory. We are not in any way trying to forget our past, um, hence the inclusion of Promise in the new name. As a matter of fact, our core mission hasn't changed and we're still committed to the five promises as outlined by America's Promise. These have been the bedrock of our organization since the beginning. And these five promises were developed from the Search Institute's 40 developmental assets that children need to thrive. And the amazing thing is that further research has shown these are the same things that adults need to thrive. So those five promises are caring adults. Caring adults are the centerpiece of children's development. They serve as guides and caretakers and advisors who give positive and productive guidance throughout their development. And that's a lot of the programs that you'll see here in a minute. We do the same thing with adults. Safe places are things that, that people need to develop intellectually and emotionally. People need physical and psychological safety at home at school, at work, and in the community. So without those safe places, those environments that encourage and support inquiry and exploration without fear of harm, people really aren't able to get support or form those positive relationships and concentrate on school and work. Healthy well, start, um, we know that healthy and well-nourished people are more able to develop their minds and bodies as they should. And they're far more capable of concentrating, learning, and thriving when they have that healthy, well-nourished body. An effective education. So with that one, you know, we have an increasingly knowledge-driven world that demands that people have the education and skills to thrive in a really competitive marketplace. And to understand the increasingly complex world in which we live, that means that in order to compete and succeed, all people need an effective education that prepares them for work and for life. And then opportunities to help others. Through service to others, people develop the character and competence they need to be helpful, hopeful, and civically engaged throughout their lives, regardless of their own circumstances. So those are the five core uh, components of Appalachian Promise Alliance and previously Bristol's Promise. Those have not changed with our name change. So our, our programs have changed over the year, and they're undergoing consistent evaluation and review to make sure that we're not duplicating what other organizations are doing and that it is still relevant to our communities. So, for example, the Sullivan County Anti-Drug Coalition began under the umbrella of Bristol's Promise. There were no other anti-drug coalitions for Sullivan County at the time, 
But as we evaluated and reviewed, it became clear that it made more sense for SCAD, um, Sullivan County Anti-Drug, to be its own independent 501c3 organization. And so that's what happened. And SCAD is now an independent um, organization. And the last audit that included them com was completed in 2019. We're still deeply connected with them as partners in the community. One of our coordinators serves on their board of directors but they are their own independent 501c3. So we don't feel the need to keep and hold all of these things forever and ever. If it makes more sense for them to spin off or makes more sense for them to be housed with another partner organization, then we absolutely want what's best for our community. Our current programs include Bristol Connect, which is a workforce sustainability program that partners with area businesses to provide wraparound services on site to the workers at that business. And this increases that personal resilience for the workers, but it also increases knowledge of ACEs and PACEs for the employers. This program has had great success with keeping workers employed, keeping them at work, lowering their stress levels so that they can focus on being caregivers to the children and youth in their lives at home. Buckle Up for Life is a car seat safety program that provides car seats to those caregivers who can't afford one and also makes sure that that car seat is properly installed. I didn't know that car seats expire. Um, so it's those kinds of pieces of information that our Buckle Up for Life program shares. Our diversity, equity, and inclusion program is one of our key programs, and it brings awareness to historical and cultural traumas that can have lifelong negative health impacts, most especially on our traditionally marginalized communities. For those of you that are aware of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, you know that those historical and cultural traumas are one of the expanded ACEs, and we want to make sure that people understand that and that we can combat those as well as the primary ACEs. Our parenting network brings together parenting educators to ensure that parents and caregivers are receiving the necessary support and resources that they need to help their children thrive. We have a parenting suite, which is a bricks and mortar uh, location where parents and caregivers can check out books or videos. They can borrow baby wearing supplies um, and learn how to, to properly do baby wearing so that the, the parent and child are both safe. Our PACES program is another key program that provides PACES training. And a lot of you uh, may be used to hearing ACEs, but we've recently moved toward PACES, which is positive and adverse childhood experiences. So as we talk about building resilience, we talk about PACES. Um, we also hold in trust the Northeast Tennessee Trauma Responsive Care Network. We currently serve as the backbone organization for the care network and provide coordination and collaboration across an eight county region. But we also coordinate with the United Way of Southwest Virginia, who holds and trust the Southwest Virginia Trauma-Informed Care Network to ensure that our region's moving forward toward more resilience together. And I saw that Susan Turner, who's our PACES coordinator, is on this Zoom today. So feel free to you know, reach out to her. Our Poverty Awareness and Education Program provides poverty simulations to community members to help them understand the demands of being socioeconomically disadvantaged. And if you've never gone through a poverty simulation, I encourage you to do so because it's an eye-opening event. Um, it's something that, that helps people understand you know, what happens in the day of life. So we also work closely with Family Promise of Bristol to ensure that those people who are unsheltered or at risk of being unsheltered are connected with the supportive systems in our community. And our Youth Networking Alliance, which is the OG of our organization, collaborates with our schools, child care providers to garner community support for them. Um, each September, we host the State of the Schools event, and we're a member of both the Virginia Early Childhood Foundation and Tennesseans for Quality Early Education. And then you can see additional programming oversights. We serve as the fiscal agent for Reading Buddies and Twin City Reads, which are both on grade level reading initiatives. So that's a little bit about um, our history, where we came from, where we're going. So let's talk about collective impact. How does that factor into the work that we do? So collective impact is just one way of working together and sharing information to solve complex social problems. We'll talk about when collective impact makes sense and when it might not be the best option. 
This is a really quick video that gives an overview of the collective impact conditions, and we'll take a little bit of a deeper dive into those in a minute. We don't have sound. I don't know what we need to do about that. Say that again, Michelle. Um, there's no sound to the video. We're not hearing hmm. it. I wonder, bear with me. Okay, well, rather than take up a lot of time, um, that will be shared with you all, but we'll we'll dive into it. What it's talking about is how collective impact has helped other areas. So it lowered youth incarceration rates by 40%. It helped bring back um, you know, green spaces in Elizabeth in, in New Jersey. Uh, so collective impact really does kind of bring communities together around those complex social issues. And Sometimes a problem can be challenging, but not complicated, right? So for instance, finding a house for the Smith family of four is definitely challenging. However, solving the nearly 3,000 housing unit deficit in the Tri-Cities Metro service area is complicated. So that's kind of the difference. Collective impact may be appropriate for the housing issue as it seeks to address those intersectional issues that are barriers to affordable or even workforce affordable housing and create that systems change that helps us prevent being in this same situation down the road. While a single service agency can potentially find housing for the Smith family, it's gonna take a multi-sector collaborative effort to solve the housing shortage issue. So therein lies the difference between a collective impact approach and one that's maybe not as complicated. And there are five conditions of collective impact. So a common agenda, that is making sure that everybody is kind of seeking to solve the same complex issues. So for the Northeast Tennessee trauma-informed care, we want to build resilience. That's our common agenda. It doesn't mean that we're doing the same work. It means that we're all working towards that common agenda. And shared measurement. We want to compare apples to apples. We know that a lot of folks are already doing evaluations. They're already doing measurements. And that's wonderful. But we want to make sure that across this collaborative effort that we are able to take this information and measure it apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Mutually reinforcing activities is another condition of collective impact. That doesn't mean we're all doing the same thing. That means that you know, somebody who works in housing may be trying to help individuals find affordable housing, but then we also maybe have elected officials who are working on finding funding to build more housing units. But then we also have people at Family Promise of Bristol who are doing case management to help people with essential skill building. So it's, it's mutually reinforcing activities that feed up into that common agenda. And then continuous communication. And I assure you all that does not mean more communication. We don't want to fill your inbox more than it already is or schedule more meetings than we absolutely have to. But it is making sure that everybody involved in that collective impact model is communicating with each other, communicating with the, the higher groups, the lower groups, and making sure that we're all on the same page. And then backbone support. And that's where Appalachian Promise Alliance is coming into play at this point for the Northeast Tennessee Trauma Responsive Care Network. We're serving as that backbone support, making sure that the partners that are involved in this have that continuous communication and know what each other are doing so that there's not duplication, but there is there are mutually reinforcing activities. So then a little bit deeper dive, there are eight principles of collective impact. And these don't get too far into the weeds, but do give you a better idea of what a collective impact model looks like. 
So it is designed and implemented with a priority placed on equity. And what that means is that the people who are at the table represent a, a cross sector. So people who um, may be CEOs of corporations sit at the same table with people who live in public housing. They have equity at that table and their voices are both heard that we are including, you know, previously marginalized community. So um, people of color, people who are members of the LGBTQIA plus community, that they are at the table, if that's something that makes sense. Then also including community members in that collaborative. So uh, our diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator has on her whiteboard in her office a big um, drawn out thing that says, don't do about me without me. So we want people who are community members who are directly impacted by what we're trying to solve uh, at the table, because they're the ones who have lived this. They have that lived experience, and it's important to make sure that their voices are heard and that they are at the table. So recruit and co-create with cross-sector partners is another of the eight principles. That means that we don't just want, you know, looking back at that housing, we don't just want housing folks there. We want businesses there. We want health and human services there. We want that, that cross-sector group to be there, to be working, to be moving forward together. And then using data to continuously learn, adapt, and improve. And for those of you that know me, you may know I am a data nerd. I love data. Um, but this is something that, that really is important to the work. If we're not looking at data, if we're not measuring things, if we're not measuring the same things, and if we're not looking at that data, how do we know if what we're doing is working or if we need to adjust it. And that's where that adaptation and improvement comes in. If it's not working, it doesn't mean we throw the baby out with bathwater. It means that maybe we just take a little bit of a different approach. And then cultivating leaders with unique system leadership skills. So Wally does this great presentation on leadership where he uh, talks about good leaders and bad leaders and helps people remember some of those. And I'm sure that we all have uh, had a leader in the past who was what uh, we like to call a minosaur, right? Somebody who's like, this is mine. You can't have this. I'm not sharing it with you. That is not conducive to a, a successful collective impact model. So we have to cultivate leaders who have those system leadership skills. A focus on program and system strategies. So making sure that um, we're looking at that big picture, making sure that systems are being impacted by this, making sure that the programs that are being provided are impacting those system strategies. Building a culture that fosters relationships, trust, and respect across partners or participants. We're really good about that in our region. So a lot of the partners who are involved in this collective impact model for the Trauma Responsive Care Network have been doing these coalitions and collaboration for years. This is just how do we do this in a formalized way um, that has success. And then customize for local context. So we can't take a trauma responsive care network out of New York City and drop it in the Appalachian Highlands and expect it to work the same way. So it has to be customized for local context. So how to implement a collective impact approach before we even get to implementation, organizations and individuals have to embrace the logic of collabor collaborative, adaptive and servant leadership. So that's kind of what today is. Before you jump into collective impact, you kind of need to understand it. Um, you have to pay attention to the adaptive work, not just the technical solutions. And I know that the second one is not trauma responsive and not trauma informed. I have been asking people to give me another, uh, another way to put this, but looking for silver buckshot instead of the silver bullet. So we want lots of people moving in the same direction with that shared agenda um, in, in their different ways, right? So looking for that silver buckshot. And then sharing credit is as important as taking credit. And that's something that we've all seen, again, going back to those minosaurs, 
we've all seen people, I have to have credit for this. And if there is an organization or a, an individual or a leader who has to have credit for it, then collective impact might not be the right approach for them. Because you have to be as willing to share the credit as taking the credit because it is everybody coming to the table doing the work. And there are some times when collective impact is not appropriate. So again, collective impact is kind of this new buzzword that everybody's talking about, but there are times that it's not a good solution for what you're trying to do. Some of those, and these are just a couple of them, if there's a limited time. So if you have a grant that's due in a month, around something that is, is system level related, collective impact is not your go-to. Collective impact takes time. It takes um, consistent and, and uh, long-term usage. So if you have something that's short-term, collective impact is not the go-to. The number one ways that collective impact models um, and coordination fails is lack of capacity. So that means that there are people who don't have the capacity to either be involved with the collective impact model or who don't have the backbone. And so that's why when Susan Turner came on as our PACES coordinator, that was us building capacity to be able to implement a collective impact model. Before then, we were doing great work. We were all kind of doing the work that we were doing, but it was more coalition work than collective impact work. And so now that we do have that capacity and that focus, what that means is having somebody who wakes up in the morning thinking about the collective impact model and goes to bed at night thinking about that as well. And then pride of place is a really nice way to say, Minosaur. Um, if somebody has to take that credit or or can't help but take that credit, uh, then this is not the the place for you. And that lack of servant leadership. And again, we we talked about that a little bit earlier. Any questions so far about any of that before we get into how it works specifically in our region? We'll move on. So this is what a collective impact model looks like. It's a broad set of partners who work to achieve that common vision supported by a backbone and steering committee. So you can see at that top, that orange bar is the common agenda and those shared measurements, those shared metrics. And on the left-hand side, you see that strategic guidance and support. That's the steering committee, the backbone support, and that backbone can be you know, several different organizations. If that's what it takes to meet the capacity, it can be one organization. So in Southwest Virginia, um, as I said, that backbone is the, the United Way of Southwest Virginia. In Northeast Tennessee at this point, it's Appalachian Promise Alliance, but we are talking with folks about, do you want to, to be involved with that backbone work? And then on the right side, that's the partner-driven action. That's where the, the rubber meets the road, right? Those are community partners, and that can be made up of nonprofits and funders, businesses, um, residents, government agencies, and it's an ecosystem of community partners. A lot of these folks on this right side are doing work already, and so there's already some crossover in those little bubbles that represent each of those, those partners. But what Collective Impact does is starts moving those into work groups. And those work groups look at things like, what are we measuring? And focusing on that data and looking at, you know, what, um, you know, what data do we need to collect? What are we already collecting? Because we don't want to create more work for our partners. But that work group is focused on that. Another work group may be focused on something like advocacy. How do we take the work that we're doing and share that with the larger community? How do we share that with our elected officials, our folks on the Hill in Nashville or in Richmond, so that they understand the work that's being done and the support that our region needs to continue to work towards that? And each of those work groups have chairs that feed into and out of the steering committee and backbone. You can see those lines that cross over have arrows that go both ways. That's that continuous communication portion. Not only do each of these work groups know what's going on in the other work groups because the chairs are sharing that information, but they're also sharing that with the steering committee. They're also sharing that with the backbone. And the goal of this really is to feed this this into the larger work that's being done by organizations such as um, the Strong Accountable Care Community, Ballot Health, Population Health. And so really they're doing 
a vast amount of work. This is one portion of that that's feeding into the larger so that we really are moving that needle on a systems change level. So that's what it looks like in a general sense. And then we built out um, what Susan likes to call the Hunger Games because we, we put it into districts. So this is what the Trauma Responsive Care Network for Northeast Tennessee looks like. You can see that instead of um, trying to do this in eight different counties, we kind of put them into districts based on similarities of demographics, of um, you know all of the, the information that we had. And we've talked with each of our counties and they said that this makes sense to them as well. So the first district is Carter, Johnson and Unicoi County. And that's in purple. So you can see that there's district one at the top for that steering committee. And then that district has individual work groups. Again, these feed information and needs back and forth between those. Also, um, we have three purple dots around the executive steering committee. That's one place for Carter, one place for Johnson, one place for Unicoi. And these areas, these counties will be the ones that decide who serves on that steering committee, who serves on the executive steering committee, who needs to be at the table, who, who needs to be at which work group, are there multiple work groups that somebody needs to be at. And you can see the same for Washington and Sullivan County, again, similar demographics. These are a little bit larger, more populous counties, and so there are only two in this district, and they have work groups, their district steering committee, and then two um, spots on the executive steering committee. The Green, Hawkins, and Hancock is district number three. And then we also have at large. So in talking with our folks, what we found was that there are organizations who need to be at the table around trauma responsive care who serve multiple counties. They might serve the upper eight or the upper 10. And so there are two opportunities for those organizations or groups to serve at large. And so they cover all of those counties. Questions about this? There's going to be a pop quiz, so you might want to ask questions. Just kidding. So we have held listening sessions uh, in, in multiple counties and will continue to do so until our next all meet, all member meeting in April. And what we're doing is, is doing this very same presentation with them so that they understand what collective impact is, that they understand how it works, because they're going to be involved in that process. And so if they can understand that bigger picture, then it makes it easier for them to participate in the process of, of achieving those goals. So the next steps for um, each of our counties, for each of the partners in those counties, and the next step that I encourage you all one is look at who's in your three feet of influence, right? This doesn't have to be um, you reaching out to the CEO of a corporation that you've never met. Like who, who's at your Thanksgiving dinner table that needs to be involved in this? Who have you gone out to dinner with recently who needs to be involved in this work? So reach out to them and start talking to them about the work that's being done in Northeast Tennessee and, and across the Appalachian Highlands region and encourage them to come to the Trauma Responsive Care Network meetings. Encourage them to get involved Involved in one or more of the work groups um, and to learn more about ACEs, about PACEs, about resilience in our community. And then help us build those work groups out because that's where the, like I said, the rubber meets the road. That's the work that you all are already doing either personally in your personal lives or, um, you know, at work. That's what, what that work comes together for you to be able to share that with other folks. So I would be remiss if I did not have a whole references uh, slide that gives you some more information about where to find more about collective impact. This is really a broad and brief overview of, of what's happening, but these are a lot of um, pieces, parts about when it works, when it doesn't. You can see that there's the 10 dangers to collective impact, and that's where you have mission drift and things like that. Um, but I wanted to give you a, a high level overview, and then encourage you all to get involved in the work that's being done. Encourage you all to, you know, come to the meetings. Our next um, meeting is in April, and we're going to have somebody come and talk to the, the all member uh, 
meeting about advocacy. What does that look like? What does that look like for us personally, for us as organizations or as businesses? How do we advocate for more resilience? For uh, that's things like funding, that's things like um, capacity building, those types of things. And then how do we make sure that we're not crossing any lines? Um, because as some of you may know, there are some organizations that are restricted by IRS laws as to what they can and can't do as far as advocacy or lobbying. So I encourage you to get involved. You can reach out to me. Um, my email is there. You can see this is part of the fun of, of just now um, going through that rebranding is that my email address is still at bristolspromise.org, um, but hopefully that'll be changing over the next month or so. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you all might have, but I do thank you all for your time. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, can you scroll down a little bit because you're, from what I'm seeing, your your email address is cut off at the bottom. Oh, yes. Oh, there it is. Okay. That, yeah. It, so, Melissa, there was, oh, I'm sorry, Wally, go ahead. I, yeah, I know Michelle has a question for you from the Q&A. But I have a question for you too, with regard to the Minosaur, which is a concept that you introduced to me, not very recently actually. Um, and I was thinking that, I wonder if I've done that because one of, you know, we, we are funded by Ballot Health and I wanna try to elevate our presence when possible. And, you know, I wanna feature our name when we're involved in stuff. And I know you do too. And, and you know, it's like, it's not, when you're doing this collective impact stuff, in some ways you want people to see that you're engaged and you might you know, endeavor to, I don't know, print your name on stuff or make sure your name's available. Is that minosaurism? Or like, how do you do that to advocate for your organization at the same time not being a minosaur? Well, and I think, you know, it's it's perfectly okay to advocate for your organization, but when you're taking, um, so when I talk about minosaurs in collective impact, what I'm talking about is if you have seen changes in those, those systems change and you say, oh, Appalachian Promise Alliance did that. No, maybe say Appalachian Promise Alliance was part of the work being done in a collective impact model. And so it's very much like our Parenting Educators Network. We not only seek to increase awareness about our parenting programs, but also the YWCA or uh, Mom Power or Aim High Tennessee or you know the other folks that are doing similar work. We want them to be elevated as well, because really you have to have this mindset of if one of us thrives, we all thrive. And we're all wanting to make our region more resilient and build that capacity for everyone. So I, I don't think that when you're elevating the Strong Brain Institute, that's being a minosaur if, if you are doing the work. Um, you know, we always, when we talk about the trauma-informed workplace recognition program, we talk about the partners that have been involved in that. We talk about the Tennessee Association of Mental Health Organizations and the Sycamore Institute and the Strong Brain Institute. So it's not just us doing that. Um, and that's part of the culture of our organization, but it really is part of the culture of collective impact as a whole. Excellent. Thank you. Michelle, I know you have a Q&A question. Excuse me. Yeah, um, people wanted to hear more about the poverty simulation, the exercise, and the opportunity. How they might um, get the information to to bring back to students and to their agencies. Yeah. So I'm I'm really glad. The first time that I ever went through a poverty simulation was back in the day when I was in college, um, and it was at the college that I attended, and it was it was an impactful experience. So. Um, Ballot Health and the Strong Kids Coalition is getting ready to do uh, a poverty simulation in collaboration with us. And, and it's a pretty big undertaking. It takes about half a day. Um, you, you really need at least 40 people who are interested in going through that simulation. We do have um, a couple of kind of less weighty um conversations around poverty that we can do. But if you're going to do a simulation, you know, we help set up the volunteers. We, um, you know, work with you to, to make sure that the space is enough, that there are tables and chairs and those kinds of things. And then it really is a day in the life. It's broken down into 15 minute increments and you are given a family unit um, and, and you have to achieve certain things. You have to 
you know, go to your job. If you're employed, you have to make it to the bank or to a predatory lender to cash your check. And so it really, uh, it really is an impactful thing. If you want more information about that, I can definitely send out the information about the strong kids that are, that's getting ready to happen. Or if you want to do one with your group, um, reach out to me and we'll get you connected with the right people. That sounds good. I think people might want to know about an opportunity and the information about how th they could engage you, maybe making an opportunity too. So we could we can send that information out. And I do have a couple people specifically who send me their their email addresses that we can send information. Um, Dr. Um, Helbert said um, we do a condensed poverty simulation in our social welfare policy course, and it takes about an hour. That is another um, opportunity, I guess, for students. Other questions, things you want to know? I appreciate um, your high-level view of collective impact, um, Melissa, because I've been in, I still don't really get it, um, and but the picture really helps in, in walking it through. This is very complicated um, with, with all the moving parts. You know what, I've, <clears throat> I'll add that I've all, ever since I first met Melissa, Melissa, I've also been learning about the collective impact model and um, Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth last summer, I believe put out a, or no, it's it actually longer than that, it was a couple of years ago, but they rehashed it last um, summer of collective impact and they put out a series of modules on it. Um, and so what I'm wondering is, how similar is that to, it seems very similar to some of the things that we've done as an institution at ETSU um, when we did, um, I forget, oh gosh, I shouldn't say this publicly, but I've forgotten the name of it. Um, the 125 chapter two, ETSU 125 chapter two, they appointed a series of task forces that were aimed at different targets. And I don't remember all the targets, but the diagram that you gave me made me think about that because I was on one of them and we were specifically interested in, you know, university life and there were others and that in the, you know, in higher ed is, is pretty parochial experience. Most people don't live in a bureau, higher ed bureaucratic world, but we are running all over the place doing our own things. And when they pulled us together to serve on these committees, these task forces, it looked like what you were showing us with your little, you know, circles with the little areas of focus and us sitting at the table. And then all of a sudden it kind of clicked into place. Like, I think we do that already for some of our higher level visioning exercises in higher education that would seem to fit the model of collective impact, but well, we don't call it that. We just call it task forces or, or visioning or strategic planning. And I think you're absolutely right there. I think a lot of people are doing doing work. I mean, it's it's coalitions on steroids, right? It is being mindful about making sure that those measurements are there. It's being mindful about that continuing communication. So it really is a framework. And a lot of people are doing this, but when you have those in the forefront of your mind, when you're making sure that you're collecting similar data, that you're, you know, working toward that shared agenda, um, or agreed upon agenda, then then that's where it kind of changes over from coalition work to collective collective impact work. So it's not as new to everybody as as you might think, or as foreign, I guess, to everybody as it might seem. Um, and that's one of the things that this is why you know we've been doing this with our our member organizations in different counties because it's not that foreign to what's been being done. It's really just agreeing that we're going to use a collective impact model and working towards that. And I will say on our YouTube page, we have all four of the collective impact um, series from Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth. They were kind enough to allow us. We did a public screening of those. They were kind enough to do that. And then there's a fifth one in our West Virginia Jobs Network that I talked about. We're working in West Virginia. Um, we're using a collective impact model with that because it's complex. And so we have uh, we asked the lead on that backbone organization, as well as the backbone organization mentor from the higher ed center to come in and answer questions. That's also on our YouTube. So that's the fifth part of that series. And I encourage you all to 
listen to it on 1.25 or 1.5 speed where we sound like squirrels, but, um, you know, they're each about an hour, hour and 15 long. Excellent. All right. Are there any other questions from the audience? This was a small group. We probably could have done this without the webinar format. Yeah. Um, we're still we're still finding our way in this space. In smaller groups, you want to you probably don't want webinar. In larger groups, you need webinar. This is probably one of those where we could have had the non-webinar format. But not seeing any questions, uh, I just want to thank you for your time, Melissa. I appreciate um, you coming on with us today. Looking forward to continue working with you on our trauma informed workplace initiative. And, uh, and to everybody else, have a great Monday.